What is up, Bitcoiners? Welcome to Bitcoin Magazine Podcast. I'm sitting here across from my boy, Joe Rogers. How's it going, Joe? What's up, man? Good to talk to you. Yeah, man. Well, we're here to listen to your interview with Tyler Winklevoss. What a way to kick off your Bitcoin Magazine Podcast career, interviewing a long-term Bitcoin bull and billionaire. Yeah, this was pretty awesome. And I did not tell Tyler this, but this was my first podcast interview. Um, so what a, what a way to kick it off. But um, he was gracious enough to take the interview. And uh, man, overall impression is that Tyler is one of us. He is a true believer. And uh, it was a ton of fun to get to talk to him. So you guys started off the conversation kind of talking about Tyler's article arguing for 500k BTC. Um, and then you guys really kind of got cosmic from there. What was your favorite part of the conversation? I think that it was pretty neat. Uh, they wrote that 500K article back in August, uh, him and his brother, and um, kind of set the stage for the conversation. And um, they really, we've seen some really great pieces put out over the years that I consider like leave behinds. These would be articles that you could take to a big family gathering. So uh, this would be one that I would print out for uh, Christmas coming up and you can leave it um, with in-laws or whoever uh, to help orange pill them. Cause he lays out a really clear picture on, you know, the bullish case for Bitcoin going to 500 K and well beyond. Uh, but that being said, that was a fun to get his perspective. And then uh, we kind of got into a bit of um, just, Talking about the state, kind of hating on the status quo. I know that you kind of uh, joke around with me being kind of doom and gloom sometime, uh, but there's definitely a shining light, which is Bitcoin. And so uh, we talked about that and uh, we talked about what kind of uh, motivates Tyler uh, besides just his role at Gemini and his big bags. Uh, he's super optimistic about the future that Bitcoin and Usher in. And then we got into... Uh, uh, health, believe it or not, you were kind of talking about carnivorism and Bitcoin as a meme. And uh, yeah, he's, he's he's super interesting and um, obviously cares about that. But I mean, overall, like I said, uh, the conversation was fluid. Uh, it was like talking to a buddy. He would definitely be someone I would like to have a beer with. And uh, I think that he's going to reach out to Sailor about that 100K party. I think that uh, he told me he had not gotten that invite yet, uh, but he's. I think that he'll be there with us. That's awesome. Well, maybe he can bring his yacht too and, uh, and you know, add some extra capacity. Anyway, before we get into the podcast, let's talk about our sponsor. It is Level, LVL.co, Just Drop the Vowels. Uh, this is a really cool exchange, Joe. Um, this, this exchange, they're not trying to be an exchange. They are operating from the mindset that Bitcoin is money and they want to provide banking services for Bitcoin and Bitcoiners, right? So, it is like signing up for a bank account with a full FDIC insured checking account that is equipped with a debit card, but that account is also directly linked to a Bitcoin wallet and you can go between USD and Bitcoin for free, no spread, no exchange fees. And I mean, they want to enable you to live off of Bitcoin. They want you to get your paycheck in USD, transfer whatever percentage you want automatically into Bitcoin. And then when you need to shave a little bit of off to, uh, to uh, you know, realize some gains or whatever, um, you can do that easily and for free um, with your debit card and their, and their, their checking account. So uh, they want to enable you to live off of Bitcoin. Um, they're backed by Jimmy Song, Anthony Papiano, several other uh, folks who are in the Bitcoin space. And it's really exciting to see them and other kind of a challenger banks, uh, fintech companies embracing Bitcoin. Like this is the future. This is the custom, This is the services that customers want and people are going to be demanding. So um, it's awesome to see Level doing what they're doing. So check them out at levellvl.co. Um, and make sure to put in code BTC media. So that way they know we sent you there. All right. <laughs> That's enough from me. Uh, let's get into this awesome conversation with Joe and Tyler Winklevoss. All right. Thank you for joining us uh, today. I've got Tyler Winklevoss, who is a co-founder and CEO at Gemini Exchange and principal at Winklevoss Capital. Tyler, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So Tyler, in August of this year, you wrote a really uh, interesting piece and you were, it's called the case for 500 K Bitcoin. And for me, uh, as I was reading it, something came to my head. I was thinking, uh, first of all, who is this article for? 
uh, because I feel like uh, with the holidays coming around, this would be one that I could print and leave behind uh, for like my boomer mother-in-law. And this is, uh, this is the kind of thing that's good orange pill uh, material. So uh, tell, tell us, who is this article for? So we wanted this to be for everyone. Um, and it was a tough uh, needle to thread because we wanted to be technical um, on a certain level, but also approachable. Um, so if someone who was a Wall Street uh, veteran could read this and understand it, and it would be sufficient analysis for them. But at the same time, you can show it to your mom or my mom, and they'd be like, oh, that's not just Greek to me. I get that. Um, that makes sense. So we tried to balance uh, the piece for the experts, but also uh, people who maybe didn't spend their whole time in finance or their whole careers in finance, analyzing the Fed and what was happening. So that was, that was the target we were going for. Awesome. So I guess for perhaps people who have not read the article, um, I have read it. I thought it was very thorough and it hit. I think you could address a lot of uh, audiences, like you just said. Could you give us the elevator pitch of the article? Yeah, the elevator pitch is that Bitcoin is gold 2.0. Um, and whatever qualities that we all agree upon over the last couple of thousand years that make gold valuable, Bitcoin has all of those qualities, but is actually superior. So Gold supply is, gold is scarce, but Bitcoin supply is actually fixed. Gold is pretty portable. You can carry it around, but Bitcoin you can send around like an email. You can divide gold, but you have to smelt it. It's difficult. You can divide Bitcoin into a hundred million pieces. So you don't have to buy a full Bitcoin. You can buy hundred dollars of Bitcoin or fractions of a Bitcoin. So when you look at, there's something like nine uh, money properties that make gold gold. Uh, Bitcoin's actually better at being gold than gold. And so once you establish that, you look at the market cap of gold, above ground gold, which is 9 trillion. You look at the market cap of Bitcoin, which is over 300 billion. And so if Bitcoin disrupts gold, it has to have a $9 trillion market cap, which means it could appreciate something like 25 to 30 X times. And if it has $9 trillion market cap, then each Bitcoin would have to be worth $500,000 each. So that's how you came up with that magic number right there based off the market right. cap for gold. It's just simple math. Yeah, sure. market cap for gold. And Bitcoin's gold 2.0, which means it's it's better than gold, right? So it, it the market cap could, could be higher. Um, yeah, do you think gold, that's a, a good core narrative for Bitcoin is gold 2.0? I, I know that over time, you probably read the articles, the uh, visions of Bitcoin. You know, it, the, the narrative around Bitcoin has changed over the years. Do you think that's a, a strong narrative uh, for us leading into 2021? Yeah, so I think that is the core narrative. That's certainly been um, my core narrative since getting into Bitcoin eight years ago. Um, and I think it's only being reinforced, the, the Bitcoin gold to point of narrative. When you see the likes of like a legendary investor like Paul Tudor Jones or Stan Druckenmiller um, coming into Bitcoin, this is why they're coming to Bitcoin because of all the, um, they're worried about what's happening with the dollar. They're worried about the, the money printing, the stimulus spending um, to get us through the pandemic and the lockdown. But this has been a problem that's been brewing even before then. Um, the U.S. has just been running uh, deficits for for way too long um, and then enter the pandemic lockdown. And we have to print even more to get our way out of it. And that's what we're seeing um, at Gemini as well. Um, Gemini is the crypto exchange custodian that I built with my brother Cameron. Um, and it's been live since 2015. We're seeing Wall Street veterans come during the pandemic because they're worried about what's happening in fiat regimes. And um, 30, 40 years ago, they'd go to gold or maybe even 20, 10 years ago. Right. But now there's Bitcoin and Bitcoin is a hard money asset like gold. It is incredible. It's the world's best hedge against inflation. And the gold story is resonating with this new class of investor that's coming into the space. And they're going to keep on coming, um, but definitely the the pandemic was a catalyst. And also it's being reinforced by publicly traded companies like MicroStrategy and Square. They're taking some of their treasury assets 
that are getting cash um, and they're putting that into Bitcoin to preserve uh, the value. Yeah, so I think that's been a, a big core, uh, a big trend in 2020 that we've witnessed is, uh, you know, corporate treasury being a thing in Bitcoin. And uh, I guess the question that I would have, how long until we see, you know, one of the FANG companies uh, put Bitcoin on their balance sheet? What, what's it going to take for them to get off zero? I think these things happen quicker than you think. If you wind back to 2017, it feels like so long ago um, because life in Bitcoin or life in crypto, it's like dog years. Yeah. Um, you know, an hour's a day, days a week, a week's a month, and a month's a year almost. Um, but it's really not that much time. And the way the narrative is today is so different. We could only dream back then of this type of um, established investors and publicly traded companies doing this. We, we could only dream of all the progress we've made. And yet every year, uh, Bitcoin and crypto continues to make that progress. And, and adoption curves are so steep these days. And we're talking about money value, which is one of the most important things in people's lives. Um, and if you're a company and you're trying to preserve your, your value, they're all looking at this. So I think, I think that um, this could all happen uh, much quicker than we think. The other question that I love to ask is when is the first, when is the, when is a central bank going to do this? Right. What's the first country that's going to do this? That's going to take a, you know, hundred million plus position in Bitcoin um, and, 30x that um, to 3 billion. You're seeing a lot of the central banks, the the rhetoric out of there is like, oh, everything's normal. This is fine. Money printing. Don't, don't, don't be afraid. But at the same time, they have been stacking up on, on gold. So I like to say, don't listen to what they say. Look at what they do. Um, cause that's a much better tell of, 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 of how they're thinking. And, um, you know, they, they know what they're doing with the, with the money printing and everything. Um, they're worried about their own currencies. They're worried about their foreign exchange, their foreign currencies on their balance sheet and they're stocking up on gold. And I think it's just a matter of time before they start stocking up on, on Bitcoin. You hit some points there that are super fascinating. And, you know, one of them, the money printing itself, um, I like to think that 2020 uh, has been a hell of a year to accelerate the adoption of Bitcoin just because of that money printer go burr meme. I mean, that, that right there by itself, it, it packs a really big punch. I know it's a silly meme, um, you know, the actual money printer, but it, it explains a lot. And I think it's something that the average Joe, the, the people that you're going to see at holiday parties, your normie friends and family members, uh, I think that they understand first principles, like, <laughs> it's not good to just print money at will, especially at the volume that they've been doing. And, uh, you know, Bitcoin is kind of the solution to that. And I hate to say it, but it's like Bitcoin fixes this, <laughs> takes the power out of their hands. Yeah, no, I think those are both um, really powerful memes. And one thing we saw in the U.S., which I didn't think we'd ever see in our lifetime, was helicopter money. Um, this yeah. note that... Um, bailouts wouldn't just go to the banks or companies like it did in in 2008. Usually the Fed or the Treasury, um, they're used to just, it, it's sort of like a B2B thing, right? They just go to the banks or the companies, they buy their toxic assets, sell them back or whatever. They open up a credit line. They never go direct to consumer, direct to the T2C or direct to the citizen. Um, and this was a, a helicopter money is what it sounds like. It's literally dropping money out of the sky from a helicopter. That's the, the Milton Friedman parable that he talked about, I think in the seventies. And I never thought that would be, you know, that would come to, to, to be in, in the U S in that here we are. And I think what it did was a couple of things. Um, obviously it helped a lot of people because, if the government, like, you know, we can argue um, economic schools of thoughts, you know, but I think what's fair to say is, is if the government's going to lock down your business, not going to allow you to open up, take your own risks, 
and let customers take their risks, right? Then they got to do something. Um, so this helped a lot of people. Um, but at the same time, I think a lot of people were sitting there and saying, where did this money come from? Like, how did this just happen? Um, it literally just fell out of the sky. And did the U.S. just wave or did the you know, Jerome Powell at the Fed just wave a magic wand and like abracadabra, like here's your check? And the answer is kind of yes. <laughs> um, and I think it woke up a lot of people to how synthetic and how manufactured um, the you know fiat currency regimes are. These centrally controlled um, fiat currencies and the fact that that can just happen, like, what does that mean about its value? And it's so plentiful, like, how does it, like, have value if it can just be printed literally like toilet paper? I think for a lot of people, it felt kind of, like, not real. And so there's been this, like, there's this psychological, I think there's a slight, like mental block with a lot of people where, and, and I me, me too, where it's sort of like you, you grow up with this, this money and it's real just because it's what you know. Bitcoin's not real because it's just, it's new and it was created not that long ago. So, you know, I, I'm just, people confuse familiarity with, with like being real um, and gravitas, but like, the the sort of the real like the psychological realness of the U.S. dollar, I think for a lot of people, that was um, that was popped, you know, with this idea that like oh money is just sort of like yeah this thing that can just appear, um, and and so I think that opened up a lot of people's eyes to the fact that like hey like this isn't just like the U.S. dollar isn't some sacred thing that's you know preordained by God, it's actually a man-made thing. It's a fiction, just like all of money. Um, we just all bought into this, you know, consensual hallucination fiction of money, this particular one. But like, what's to say that we can't um, buy into something else? Or, or why is this like, you know, holier than now money compared to some other type of money? And then um, once you start asking that question, and if you get curious and dig a little deeper in the history of money, you realize that like money's been so many things throughout history. It's been right. precious metals, it's been um, seashells, you name it. Seashells in 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 prison in certain situations, like prison yards, it's it's cigarettes. Um in certain areas, it's been um, I guess um bottles of Tide because like it's useful <laughs> uh, it tends to just be like good currency everybody needs to wash their clothes and it sort of has that dual purpose of of being something you can use but also it holds its um you know it's not that perishable um and so yeah and in like it's it's it hasn't been the u.s dollar um and even the u.s dollar has changed it used to be pegged to gold um in the 70s we couldn't afford our wars, so we stopped pegging it to gold. And so even fiat currency has been this evolving thing. And so, um, yeah, okay, Bitcoin, that sounds pretty cool. Why not? And I think a lot of people, um, you know, that I think that was an eye-opener for a lot of people. And it made them open to, um, and I also think that 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 the, the stock market has benefited a lot from a lot of people, especially um, the younger generation being like, hey, like I need to figure out a way to invest. Like I need to, um, I'm a little worried of being shackled to um, my paycheck and my job because that can end. And I need to build savings, but I need that savings to work for me. And so I just think that a lot of, um, we've seen a lot of young people. I think this this generation is more interested in becoming financially literate and financially independent. And they're also more open-minded because they're young than any generation before. So I don't think that the average 20-year-old, um, 
25 years ago was thinking about trading stocks or um or you know investing in the stock the S&P or or even crypto obviously crypto wasn't didn't, wasn't around but even, like even questioning what money is that's right and and um that's right and things have been pretty good very good in the US like for the most part that breeds complacency you know if you talk to someone who grew up in Zimbabwe Venezuela Argentina, they don't have that complacency with with money and, and the fact that it just it'll just work. It'll just work, you know. Um, and the the U.S., um, you know, for the most part, since even like post World War II, like things just worked out. Um, and you know, there was the seventies or a stagflation. Um, and actually, the big trade back then, Paul Tudor Jones talked about was um was gold you know because of the 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 high inflation rates i think it, they may have gone you know double digits and whatnot but for the most part um you know we've had our ups and downs but but it's kind of worked out and 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 when that happens you just it's easy not to question the system sure. um and then but i do think that in the last two decades we had the, the tech bubble, um, but we we had the the credit crisis, and a lot of it felt I think people felt was like, um, you know, man made. You know, we kind of like did it to ourselves, and of course that was the backdrop where Bitcoin was invented. So I love the fact that people have options. Um, I don't think currency should just be the domain of a government, just like um, language. You know, it shouldn't be the domain of a government or or math, um, you know, or science. And um, yet, money has been for a while in the U.S. It's so centrally planned. And I love the fact that um, you know, there's a point when when um, you know there was private currencies in the U.S. and, and companies had that. And and I I, I guess I'm. Um, I'm of the camp of more free markets, more emergent uh, currencies, as opposed to by dictat. Like this is the currency because we say, well, I mean, why can't people come to that decision for themselves and choose the currency that they want to trust? Maybe they have more trust, depending on where they are in the world, in a currency issued by a company than by their um, you know, local government. And, and it reminds me, uh, uh, Dr. Paul, Dr. Ron Paul was on uh, Stefan Levera's podcast. And uh, Dr. Paul, I don't think that he fully understands, you know, the implications of Bitcoin per se, but he has, you know, for decades been a champion of uh, freedom of competing currencies. And that's good enough for me. Uh, you know, like he doesn't have to fully understand every detail about Bitcoin, but the fact is, you know, the market should have options. And um, so I'm right there with you on that one. Yeah, why not? What are we afraid of? <laughs> I think it's uh, it's pretty obvious. I think the answer is probably the control uh, that they have. And I think that, you know, we're starting to see some, you know, more aggressive moves by even uh, other governments around the world. Uh, you've probably seen some of the action uh, coming out of France, you know, their attempt to uh, be able to capture all cryptocurrency transactions uh, essentially trying to KYC, AML, all crypto transactions uh, over there. I guess curious to, on your opinion about, you know, the the recent proposal of the Stable Act and, um, you know, how our legislators are just out of touch or do you think that this is going to be a big red flag for, you know, Bitcoin adoption moving forward? It's a great question. I actually recently tweeted about it um, a week or so ago when it came out, but it reeks up to me that that banks have lobbied hard to get um, this legislation proposed um, because they are worried that big tech or tech companies um, will issue currencies, stable coins, and banks want currency and money to be the domain of banks. The banks have, like we talked about earlier, they have traditionally been 
the distribution pipes for the Fed and the Treasury. They are like Bitcoin miners, right? They sort of they're the protectors of their currency. They're the they're the distribution channels. They're how people they're the middlemen between people and the Fed and the Treasury. They don't want to give that up, just like governments don't want to give up their the 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 their purview of the currency. You know, yeah. it's a control it, thing. So that that point right there, it just blows my mind. It's like they're trying to protect you know, the status quo, but at the same time, you know, central banks around the world are looking at digital currency for themselves. And that that's gotta be incredibly uh, dangerous for, you know, local and regional bankers. You know, essentially that might take a lot of their services just right out of their, out of their hands. Look, the worst part about that bill, and my understanding is that it doesn't have a lot of legs, um, at least um, anytime soon. Um, I think that it, 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 you know, the next session is something like early January, and it's just not going to be seen as a priority. But the worst part about that bill is was the tweet um, from Representative Talib saying that we can't let tech do to people what the banks have done. So we're going to make sure that only banks can do this with the stablecoin. Yeah. Um, it's sort of like punishing um, tech companies for sins they never committed and then um, making, giving a monopoly to the sinners on future uh, innovation with regards to, to uh, stablecoin issuance. So it was hilariously poor. It was, I think I tweeted, unstable rationale. <laughs> It will do exactly what uh, Representative Tlaib is worried about um, happening, and it will be it will give um, the um, a monopoly on innovation in the stablecoin space to banks, and that's never giving anybody a monopoly, especially banks, has never been good for innovation or consumer protection. So the bill was ironically or uh, just really misguided in, in like sort of the effect and, and poorly thought out. And it sounded like incredibly hypocritical and bought by the banks. I, I think, and I think people see that. It's really sad. You know, I don't think that the bill has a lot of legs, but just the fact that an elected official could be so um, misguided or on purpose, purposely misguided to propose something like that, that is really so embarrassing and an affront to American values of innovation and competition and free markets. I think that's the alarming thing. I think people need to realize that like, look, either this kind of bill is being proposed out of sheer incompetence or worse, um, you know, this is actually what um, our elected officials believe in which is scary we deserve better we we, we should we should uh demand better and so this is the kind of political hackery where yeah, politicians um and, and whatnot um they can really hurt innovation they can really hurt america and we have been big proponents of regulation in the space for the companies that hold a lot of value for uh, for their customer base, which is very different than regulation on a protocol level. But also, um, there's a huge you know, point about that. We're very pro-thoughtful regulation. And regulation is a spectrum that um, you know, can be done right, you know, thoughtfully, that actually ushers in healthy markets and um, is great for everyone. And then it can be too light where it's Wild West and you have Mount Gox's of the world happening, those kind of um, you know, catastrophic events. And it can be on the other end extreme, it can be way too, um, it can just stamp out and extinguish competition. It can be too restrictive. Regulation is important on some level, especially with the companies that hold value, um, but it has to be done thoughtfully and the Stable Act was 
a thinly veiled attempt to to um, extinguish competition, give banks a monopoly, um, and it's just terribly thought out regulation. And I'm hopeful that it, it goes nowhere, but also alarmed that you know people can still you know spin that out and put their names on it. Yeah, it, it uh, it's alarming to me because it normalizes this kind of dialogue. It just it pains me that this is even being proposed. And uh, I don't know, you, you hate to see it, but kind of in the same um, line of thought, I, you were recently quoted saying uh, Bitcoin is like a square peg and a round hole for the financial system. And I guess my question to you is, uh, this has been a, a common theme in 2020 here recently, uh, but what does the Great Reset mean to you? I think usually I actually, when I say square peg round hole, I'm talking about um, like existing legacy payments working on working on the internet and and how bitcoin is actually the the first ever internet native money so it actually works the same way your email works it's not um shoehorned onto the internet like credit cards you know our our legacy money that was built before the internet even existed bankers built credit cards they built ach they built wire swift all of these protocols that are pre-internet protocols and we've done a decent job of creating the illusion that they work on on the internet. Like PayPal is probably like a really good example where it it's like this body kit that skins these non-internet um, payment networks onto the internet. And if you have, if you're privileged enough to have permission to get a bank account or open a PayPal account, which is which is by far not everybody in the world um, by a long shot. Most people in the world don't have credit cards or bank accounts or whatever that percentage is, it's staggering um, how few people, even in the, how many people in the U S can't get basic ac- um, access to financial services that many of us take for granted. So I love Bitcoin because it's, it's the first money built for the internet by the same type of engineers that built the internet. It's not built by bankers. And if you have a phone with a data connection, um, all of a sudden you have a bank account in your hand or your pocket, you don't need permission from a bank, you know, to open an account and stuff. You, you, you know, you can kind of leapfrog that. So, and then there was a second part of your question, which escapes me. <laughs> yeah. The second part was, you know, I, I think you laid it out perfectly what you mean by square peg and round hole. And I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, but with that in mind, you know, what does the great reset mean to you? This is kind of a, a narrative put forth by the world economic forum at yeah, uh, Davos. Yeah. And uh, it's kind of, it, to me, it feels like um, the uh, 2020 and the pandemic and the power that I guess the state has put forth kind of has propagated or propped up this idea of the Great Reset. And they're talking about um, kind of swiping debt away, centralization of money, just I think it's over overarching, just complete uh, control by the state. I was curious just to get your your thoughts on it, but we, we don't have to touch on it if you're not familiar with it. So is the idea that um, the same people who screwed everything up are now going <laughs> to fix it? They're here to fix it. Yeah, they're they're here to make it wow. up for us. That, this is like this is like uh, when you're when you're on the golf course. Okay, this is this is the metaphor. Um, you slice the ball into the trees. You completely shank it, and you go into the trees and there's this one foot by one foot by one foot, you know, opening, right? This like tiny opening. I've seen Bagger Vance, of course. What's that? Bagger Vance with Will Smith. Yeah, he's got to hit it through yeah, the yeah. tiny hole. So trying to get through those woods towards the pin <laughs> instead of laying it back onto the fairway. Like, so you think that like all of a sudden now you're going to become, you're going to shoot a Tiger Woods level shot after you just blew an easy shot. And so, yeah, what, what is the, the famous quote is, is um, you know, insanity is trying the same thing and expecting a different outcome. I have no faith in our leaders to, uh, in any of the global leaders to sort these problems out. So, I, but I do have faith in the private sector. I have faith in the inventors, the innovators. Um, and the technology community to figure it out. The U.S. has 
run a budget surplus only four times in the last 50 years. Um, I don't know if you remember when Ross Pro ran in 92. I was, I think, 11 years old-ish, 10 or 11. Um, and it was a big deal because he was independent candidate, I believe, um, definitely not, um, you know, Republican or Democrat. Entrepreneur, and right. Entrepreneur from Texas. And his whole platform was balance the budget, the debt's out of control. That was almost 30 years ago. And uh, the debt's only gotten more out of control. The, um, the deficit spending has become, you know, we just keep doing it more and more of it. It just keeps getting worse. And no party has the, um, the stomach to, you know, put austerity measures. Like austerity measures are really hard. Um, to chase in spending once people get addicted to more spending, bigger government deficit, um, it's it's very difficult to to unwind that. Um, and neither party, neither party is is um, seems to have any appetite or will to do so. It, I feel like um, it's, it's because um, elected officials are so laser focused on getting reelected. And so they, their actions and activities are all solely focused around that. And so that means immediate gratification. And like the things that you're touching on are things that take longer than perhaps one term. Uh, so they, it would require longer term thinking, which, you know, in my opinion, fiat in general doesn't support long term thinking, you know, it's very quick, fast now. Uh, whereas Bitcoin is, you know, a longer time horizon thinking because it is deflationary. Um, it you know lowers your time preference. The way at least the 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 U.S. is treated, it's been so hand to mouth. And in the blog we wrote, um, you know, the case for 500k Bitcoin, we talk about um, not just what's happened to the pandemic, but what happened since 08. And in that crisis, um, you know, we had the TARP um, stimulus, or you know, um, to to get us out of that tailspin. We, according to the economic bureaus and, and all the numbers, we were out of that crisis by sometime in 2009. And so we were kind of like in the clear. Um, we, we, we'd uh, uh, escaped, you know, disaster, or turn it around, let's put it that way. What proceeded to happen was the longest bull run, I think, in U.S. economic history um, from 2009 until um, March when the lockdown, you know, and the pandemic hit here in um, 2020. So over a decade of the longest bull run. And what you generally want to do, the conventional wisdom is that during a bull run, you want to run a surplus. So you don't, and however you want to do that, you want to spend a little less, um, maybe raise taxes a little bit more. Um, you know, you, you, you probably want to have um, higher interest rates. Like you want to tighten the belt um, and save, save and put some, you know, powder, you know, keep your powder dry. So that one, when, when the black swan events come like a pandemic, it creates a heavy, um, demand shock on the economy, you have all these tools at your disposal. So you can lower taxes more, you can spend more, you can lower interest rates from, you know, 5% to 0%. Like you imagine what that would, that kind of impact would, would have. Right. Um, but the efficacy of these tools are only as great as, as um, however often they are summoned. If they, the novelty of them matters, right? Um, if you've been if you've been hanging out with low taxes, and you've been spending a lot, and your interest rates have been low during a bull run, then there just isn't much rope for you to work with. It's kind of like hitting the turbo in a sports car all the time. 
um, the turbo becomes just how <laughs> like the normal becomes normal. Right. It becomes, it becomes uh, uh, the normal situation. So like there is no more turbo, right? No one uh, wants to turn the turbo off on their watch. Exactly. Everyone's on this you know, four-year re-election cycle. Um, and as much as the Fed is quasi-independent, it feels like, yeah, everyone's in on it, you know? Everyone's like, yep, okay, let's keep things, let's keep the party going, um, keep kicking the can down the road. Um, for the next, the next folks, the next generation, um, and so, so yeah, I, I, I have very little faith that the same people who got us here, um, <laughs> are going to get us out of here. And, and that's backed up by decades and decades of, of data. So yeah, the track record's not so hot. It's not <laughs> in your article. I think you, you put out some great, um, stats and charts, uh, you know, showing them to supply just growing so rapidly. You guys highlight uh, GDP to debt ratios, just what 135%, I think is what's quoted in the article. It's just yeah. absolutely bonkers year. And to think that they're going to get us out of this is just absurd. Uh, but that, you know, that's why I think you and I were, were so bullish and excited about, you know, Bitcoin in general. So, um, for you, um, besides like, you know, wealth preservation and Gemini itself, uh, do you have any other like driving factors behind your passion for Bitcoin? I do. Um, but one other thing before we get there, sure. um, the 135% debt to GDP ratio is a really, um, significant number for the U S um, for, for two, two, two things I think are interesting about that. There's probably a lot more, but I'll just say two things. The debt to GDP ratio of the U.S. during World War II was 121%. So it's significantly higher right now. But back then, we had full employment. Like everyone was employed because it was a war effort. We were building tanks, planes, ships, everything right so 121 percent record employment today it's 135 percent we've seen record unemployment um you know double digit unemployment and we are definitely not producing um all out like we were during world war ii we weren't producing you know the output in fact our economy is it's the opposite it's shut down so really scary um really scary uh, stark differences in, in sort of those two points in time. And at least in the chart I looked at uh, recently, World War II was the highest debt to GDP ratio um, in the U.S. ever until right now. So anyone who says that we're, you know, not in uncharted waters or everything's going to be fine, this is great, um, we'll get out of this, like, just is not looking at the data. Right. Um, so I think that like, we just have to be like very aware of, of exactly where we are. The other really chilling fact that I've come across is I believe that every currency that has, every country that's had this high debt to GDP ratio, the probability of default is like really, really high. Now, the the U.S. may be in a different, a slightly different odds because it's the global reserve currency and the world's trade for the most part is is um, denominated and settled in U.S. dollars. So it gives us more cushion, more a wider berth, let's say, um, and more forgiveness um, with our currency, but. We are in an area where historically um, the percentage is that countries actually bring that debt to GDP ratio down and sort of clean their act up is is very low. Those are chilling facts. And that, to your first point, um, you know, the, the people who beat the drums of, you know, the money printer uh, saying, you know, oh, we, we can get out of this. It happened in World War II. Uh, like you said, they're just completely glancing over the other facts that aren't, you know, present on the chart itself. 
um, you have to look at the big picture. And sometimes that's hard to do when you're an economist, probably. That's right. That's right. So passion about, about crypto. Yeah. Yeah. Let's lighten it up because uh, I know that uh, <laughs> yeah. there's a lot of bad in 2020, uh, but I feel like that, that shining light for me personally it is Bitcoin and just the hope and promise it brings. But uh, yeah, the question I had was, you know, besides a uh, store of wealth and Gemini, uh, do you have any other driving factors behind your passion for Bitcoin? Despite all of the, the uh, stark facts, um, I'm definitely um, an optimist, um, very much so. I think that's a really important um, characteristic as an entrepreneur, but just in general. Definitely a glass half full type person, if you will. So I love Bitcoin because it brings together so many different disciplines. I can't think of investment I've ever made or could have made. I couldn't think of a sphere that I could be building a company in that would bring together so many different disciplines and make me learn and think and question in a way that Bitcoin has. So whether it's like economic schools of thought, whether it's like how um, protocols, um, computer protocols work, whether it's um, uh, like market structure, like capital market structure, it's, it's like a combination of Wall Street, um, getting a PhD in economics. Um, it touches everything. Uh, 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 getting getting a degree in computer science, understanding networks, human behavior. Yeah, it literally, you said it so well, it, it touches everything. And you can go down so many rabbit holes about game theory, cryptography, what's a hash function, how does it work, you know, um, the math behind it all, the the incentive structures of like, why does Bitcoin, why does it work so beautifully? Why does everyone coordinate together? The Byzantine generals problem, you know, how do these strangers around the world that don't even know each other are able to come to agreement or consensus on something um, when with, with no trust involved whatsoever um, in a trustless fashion. So, you know, I, I, you know, that, that just, um, just completely fascinates me, took me in from day one. And I, I've never stopped learning every day I've been in this space. I never will stop learning in this space. I mean, there's just, there's no limit. It's infinite. Um, and so I'm so, so grateful that I can, A, um, that, that I can dedicate my life to something, which I have, that's so intellectually, like, it's rare, like, it's hard to for your job to also be your passion and be the most intellectually stimulating thing in your life. Did, I, did that happen over like when you first discovered Bitcoin or did this kind of discovery of all these disciplines and your, your passion for Bitcoin, did it grow over time? So I, I think early on, um, it, it's impossible to understand Bitcoin without touching on a bunch of different things. Like we were saying about um, the gold, um, the gold like framework. So like you come, you, you come into, you come into Bitcoin, right? You, you first meet it and you have like, what the, what the heck is this thing? You know? And you start understanding its attributes. It's a fixed supply. Um, it's a money protocol. It works on the internet. Um, it's like digital gold built for the internet. Um, then like, okay, who created it? Like <laughs> is it a company, like, can I invest in this company? So the creation myth alone completely seduces you. Um, you're like, what? Nobody knows who created this. And then you're like, wait, is that a good thing or a bad thing? And then you realize like, that's one of the best things ever because it's not about a human. It yeah. transcends any person or group. It's about the math and it's about the, the, the source code and it's completely transparent. And so we don't have to get um, caught up on like, the fallibility of some human being and, you know, whether or not they're like an upstanding individual in society or who, who knows. Right. But who cares? It doesn't matter because, because, um, you know, it, it's, it's the code speaks for itself, you know? And, and so, so the creation myth, 
the what you know what are the qualities of this okay what's an analog okay gold and then you sort of understand okay but like money's this green piece of paper in my wallet or it's a plastic credit card like i can't touch this yeah i can't touch this and <laughs> like mc hammer right uh, <laughs> and um and so like i don't understand and then like oh wait wait money can so you have to study the, the origins the history of money money can be anything it's what we all agree it is um and money is an invention that's been um people have been iterating on uh since um you know humans first created the concept of money and it can be and it will and, and so bitcoin's the latest iteration of that you know programmable soft money as software kind of thing so i mean we just went through a a a, a quick you know couple topics of of uh the thought process of when you when you meet Bitcoin and you're trying to wrap your head around it. And each one of those things, at least for me, is just super fascinating. I've always loved technology, always loved computers. I majored in economics at Harvard as an undergrad. Um, you know, always wanted to be an entrepreneur. Dad's an entrepreneur, um, has a software B2B company. So I grew up in a startup, hanging around engineers as a kid. Um, would read the the magazines lying around about, you know, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, all the Silicon Valley legends. So, um, yeah, it was just sort of like uh, this was uh, I was built for this and it was built for me, I guess. Um, but I, I see this passion in other people, too. As soon as they they get into Bitcoin or they they, they buy a little bit, they get bit by the bug. I mean, they're light, their eyes light up when we talk about it. It's and it's everybody like it's random people on the street um, from everything from, you know, Uber driver, taxi cab driver to, you know, whoever um, people, people get so excited about it because they see what we all see, which is everyone sees who, who sort of gets into this and gives it um, enough time is that, it's so optimistic because it can build a better future. You can both uh, do very well, um, per, like economically for yourself, but also do very good for the world around you. And there's very few pursuits where you can credibly say that, hey, um, if this works out, we're going to change the world for the better. And we're going to do do very well. We're going to you know, get wealthy doing it. Um, you know, it's hard to say that if you're, you know, uh, no disrespect, but it's, it's just harder to make that argument if you are a hedge fund manager or if you are a banker. Um, even if you are a value investor, like, you know, it's just harder, it's harder to, to make those arguments, you know, or rather nothing can really make the argument as better as well as the promise of Bitcoin, the promise of crypto. And so dedicating um, my life to ushering in that promise seems like one of the most noble things I can do. Also, one of the most exciting things I can do. Um, and so, yeah, I, 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 I've never found anything that can, can um, check all those boxes um, um, so if I do, I'll let you know, but, um, <laughs> I think I'll be, I think I'll be hanging out here. You have many um, decades of, uh, self-learning ahead of you. So many. And, and the people in the space are brilliant. They're fun. Um, optimistic in general, in my experience. Optimistic. Like there's a, there's an underdog vibe in, in the best of ways. There's, um, just intellectually just really amazing um so i yeah I, I wake up every morning and i just like thank my lucky stars that that this space became a space thank you satoshi um yeah. i think that, and, uh, the, the whole fact that bitcoin is free and open source you know anyone can develop on it which is you know fascinating in itself uh but because of that uh, free and open source nature, like you said, all these disciplines are emerging. 
And so what, what you see happen is you get expertise in these different dif- disciplines and it benefits Bitcoin as a whole. So you get expertise in all these different domains and it makes all the other domains stronger. And it's, it's just like this uh, uh, positive feedback loop. I know there's a lot of different positive feedback loops for Bitcoin, but you know, this is the by far the strongest one, just all the disciplines working together to prop up the other ones. Yeah, totally. Um, and it's just been so like incredible. We, we can all easily lose sight of, of where we came from and how far we've come. Um, but the, 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 um, the progress that Bitcoin has made in its short lifespan already is, is unbelievable. Nobody would, everybody bet against, I mean, not everyone, but <laughs> clearly oh, not everyone, oh, right? Not everyone. Uh, <laughs> You and I didn't, and there's a few others, um, but gosh, like the, the vitriol, like, oh, it's tulips, it's going to be illegal, it's for you know, drug runners and illicit activity and you know, Silk Road and all this stuff. And, um, you know, it just made, made our jobs easier, right? I mean, I think when you, when you know something um, is great and a lot of people don't, that's that's opportunity, um, and there's still that opportunity. I think still exists with Bitcoin. I think Peter Thiel says it so well in his book Zero to One. You know what's that truth that you know that's wide out in the open that you know is true, but other people don't know exists or don't agree with. Because you have to be, you have to be willing to be called crazy for some period of time. Um, all of the best ideas, you know, there's more naysayers in the beginning than there were at the end because you're doing something that's different, you know, um, and and a lot of people don't don't like change. We, we, we sort of people say they do. Oh, yeah, it's great. But like for whatever reason, a lot of people kind of fight change or the freedom to the fluidity of it. Um, so Bitcoin is one of those those ideas that really shakes people to the core, especially it people challenges who challenges everything you believe in. I mean, if you really <laughs> yeah. pull back the curtains, man, it, it challenges your understanding of how the, the world functions and, you know, forces you to learn things that you're not taught in school. I mean, you mentioned your undergrad at Harvard as an economics major. I mean, did you talk about any kind of Austrian theory or money itself? I mean, maybe you did, but, um, I've talked to a lot of other guys and gals that have studied econ and they never once talk about the origin of money. If I remember correctly, it didn't really, we didn't go like deep um, into Austrian or like the origins of money. It, it, it very much stuck with the way that like the system today. Yeah. This is the, the way it works. Don't ask questions. Learn it. So uh, my my F ten professor was Marty Feldstein at Harvard. He was Reagan's. I think he was an economic advisor to Reagan. Greg Mankiw. Um, they all have books out, and they're very you know classic. But I don't remember. I took it. I took econometrics at some point. I don't remember these kind of questions that Bitcoin threw at me. Let's put it that way. Sure. Um, Definitely some great stuff. Learned a lot, you know, um, you know, glad I um, studied with these legendary um, professors, but, you know, and also there, there, yeah, there may have been like electives in other ways, but like, yeah, like I didn't, we didn't, we did not, um, the questions were not thrown at me as an undergrad um, economics major at Harvard the way they were thrown at me when I came to Bitcoin of like, what actually is money? Is it always something that is decreed by government? And like, look, to be fair, I was doing a lot of things in college also, right? I was, I was a varsity athlete. So I didn't have, um, you know, time was pretty sparse. You do the coursework, you read the books, the chapters that are signed. I didn't have a lot of time to wander off to the right or to the left, you know. And, yeah, it isn't like you picked up human action uh, casually on a weekend. Right, right. 
uh, there wasn't, yeah, it wasn't, um, you know, a ton of time to go check out Hayek or, or, um, you know, the different, um, the different schools of thoughts. You just sort of like, it, it was a pretty mainstream one, at least in the, in the, um, in the, uh, the path that I was on. So yeah, like, look, I had a great, I got a great education at Harvard. Um, I think frankly in the university, uh, system, the education is really what happens. The greater education is what happens outside the classroom. Um, you know, at the row house, at the, at the boathouse, um, you know, in the cafeteria, the conversations, obviously, um, we got up to some interesting stuff with social networking, which is probably, um, outside the scope of, of this, this conversation, but, you know, you can do entrepreneurial things. Um, so, um, but this was, Bitcoin was a, was a whole nother education, right? Even, even, even going to Harvard, doing econ, um, and learning a lot, um, about this area and just having like a natural, like inclination towards it. Um, there was still a lot of assumptions baked in that I had that I just accepted, um, that Bitcoin like shattered, like really, like, you know, and and it was a, it was an eye opener, right? You know, you kind of think like, oh, I kind of think I get it, how the world works a little bit. And then Bitcoin's like, no, you don't. Yeah. Like you have no idea and you need to like read more and study up on the history of money and ask yourself like harder questions. And um, so, yeah. And there, there's a, there's a, I'm an optimist and I'm also um, a truth seeker. I'm, I'm a, I, I asked the question that has always been, been me, you know, in the sense of like, Oh, why, why do we do it this way? And that's, I think that's why I love entrepreneurship because like I wrote in high school, but there was no high school, um, rowing at my school and my next door neighbor, um, was a championship rower and people said, Oh, you could be. You should check out rowing. You've kind of got the rowing build, tall, lanky, and I. But I couldn't, and there was all this water around. So anyway, I found a rowing club, started the rowing. My first, our first startup, my Cameron, we and my, my and I, we joked that our first startup was actually starting the the rowing team at our high school. Nice. And then we rowed, became junior, um, went to the junior. Uh, and junior national team made that road in the junior world championships in Plovdiv, in Bulgaria in 1999, uh, right after it was coming out of, um, I guess, you know, the iron curtain and kind of trying to transition into more, uh, free market type, uh, economy, interesting, um, experience. And then wrote at Harvard four years, national champions, and then went to road in the Beijing Olympics in 2008. So, um, that, that all happened because we were like, okay, well, I love to row. Oh, there's no rowing. Um, Make it happen. And we just didn't accept it. Yeah. We just manufactured our opportunity. We're like, okay, we're going to change that. I'm, and it reminds me of that, the Steve Jobs quote of, um, you know, just, just the, when you realize that the world that you've inherited wasn't built, was built by people no smarter than you. And you can, you know, shape it how you want, you know, you can, you, you too can, can do that. And so we've done that from an early age um, and um, definitely like to question things. And I was talking, I interviewed uh, Richard, Sir Richard Branson a few years back and um, for the serious episodes that we did, we did, we interviewed a few people, did a couple episodes um, limited time only and he you know his stories were were like very similar like he you know he always all these companies seem to start from a from his own frustration that oh why can't i buy or i want to read this type of magazine so he, it's like but it doesn't exist so he traded it i want to buy records in the store and he just traded i want to fly from here to here nobody's got that leg okay I'm going to start chartering planes and, and make this happen. And he really just like solved his own local problems by starting businesses. And um, all of them were like out of 
this frustration with like, I, the world is, is this, and I'd like to see it be that. And nobody else is stepping up to do that. So by, uh, you know, Josh gone and I'm going to have to go, I'm going to step up and, and do that myself. And, uh, he's just done that like over and over again. And I think that's ultimately what a lot of these, you know, great entrepreneurs do Elon Musk or whatever. Um, they just, they, they don't accept the world that they inherited. Just like you don't have to accept the money that was handed down to you. You can, you know, opt out of that system. You can buy Bitcoin, you can build a company around it. Um, so, so yeah, that's always, I guess, I guess it really, I was ready. I was kind of like primed for, for Bitcoin, you know, from the get go. Absolutely. Are, are you still rowing to this day? You know, I, um, I work out on the rowing machine. I live in Manhattan for the most part, most of the time, although 2020 is that year where it's hard to, you know, hard to go to the gym, right? Well, it's, it's not bad. It's sort of, well, yeah, hard to go to a gym, but I, I've managed to work out actually quite a bit. Um, just running outside, you know, um, you know, figuring out ways to do body weight exercises and stuff. Um, 2020 is just the year we're like, we're all untethered to where we actually live. I feel like a lot of people are just floating in a good way. Um, in Manhattan, the water is actually pretty rough uh, for you. Uh, rowing, the type of rowing we did is, is still water or lake. Um, so it's a little bit hard to, you know, get get to that situation sure. but i have a i have a rowing machine it's called an, they call, it's called ergometers for those people in the now and so i'll do the you see them in the gym the concept two machines um they're pretty big with the crossfit community and a lot of the other workout systems but um i'll, I'll do that um to get the cardio going and i think if, if, if one day i lived uh in the country i could see myself getting into it but um time is precious now so you know, throwing on the trainers and going for a quick jog or, you know, um, you know, getting on the run machine for a little bit or, you know, doing push-ups. Like I try and optimize, you know, um, as much and I just don't have as much time to row. So I'm staying in shape though. My, my sport these days is, is, is been skiing. Lately, nice. So, so the, part of, uh, this, like, uh, bitcoin culture there there's a like subgroup of uh like carnivores have you messed around with any of that kind of like carnivore diet i have not um well okay so carnivore diet um uh i've done uh the keto diet and i don't know if that counts but it's all um protein it's no sugar yeah um so you can have safety would say no 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 that was does not count <laughs> It does not count. Yeah, I think Saifedean would be like it's meat or bust. Ah, okay. Well, <laughs> I've done a, a heavy meat um, diet in, or a sugar-free diet, and that was a pretty big eye opener. There's sugar is so pervasive in everything we eat in the world around us. I, I think sugar is like the smoking of our generation. Um, it's like the cigarettes of our generation. It's you know, like fiat food. money. It's just, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's very bad for your health. Uh, be careful. Um, but, um, quitting sugar, you know, um, we our bodies are so used to it. Um, I highly recommend it. I never slept better. I lost weight. My energy levels were super consistent and had great stamina, um, like very grounded, um, sugar, sugar is the devil. That's my conclusion. Um, you should limit Did you have withdrawals at first when you went on that? So, um, yeah, like I would say that, um, uh, it was like, like, yeah, like headaches, runny eyes kind of thing. Um, and just your mood, like, um, <laughs> there was a sense that like, um, man, is, is the world ever going to be exciting again? <laughs> like, <laughs> mildly uh, depressed slash flat because you're, you like, don't have this upper, you know, you're not getting stoned on sugar every moment. Or Do you like, want it, like caffeine in that same camp? Have you tried to, I, I don't know, are you a coffee drinker or anything like that? So I go back and forth. I think at yeah. the time 
when I did keto, um, I think I wasn't, I wasn't drinking caffeine then. Um, so what I'll say is it took about two weeks and my body's like, stop whining. It was like, okay, I accept that I'm not going to get sugar anymore. <laughs> like, and then it like started behaving well. It, like I, you know, my, my mood was plenty high, was high as it ever, you know, got before it was happy. My outlook was good. Um, dropped, you know, got dropped like some unnecessary weight, you know, a few pounds here and there just got like, you know, more cut. Um, and all those benefits of like, you know, it's also like liberating because when you are on a sugar diet, whether you know it or not, you're, you're, you're sort of, um, your body is always like, when's the next hit? You know, it's, it's looking for, it is, um, it's, um, it's just waiting for the next sugar hit, you know, so it's like the liberating next... if you can actually break that. Yeah. Habit. Because you're no longer like, Oh, I need to get my fix of sugar. If I don't eat, you can actually go without eating for a while. Like when some people say they eat like one meal a day, cause their body just, and, and it's, they're not even trying to do that, like limited intake, but because the body isn't becoming this, it, it, it's no longer this monster. Yeah. You can that, go like, like 90 days without eating food. Of course, water is every day. You need yeah. Water, water is like how long different. you can go without eating food. Totally. And, and, and so not having to like always run to get your sugar fix to be ready for a meeting or whatever. Um, that's super liberating. You like you, you quit a drug with sugar. Um, and you know, all of a sudden the malaise of like, Oh, like I, you know, that raises, and then your energy is like super consistent. You're not as like highly reactive to like, you know, that email that comes in that sort of like before would be kind of upsetting. <laughs> uh, you're, you're just like, you're so like, it's a, it's a mood changer. It sounds like. I thought, I thought so. Yeah. My experience was, and these days um, it was just cool to sort of dry out. Right. And, and I wasn't like, you know, that, heavy on sugar right yeah you I mean, didn't have like secret stashes of skittles in your desk or anything like that yeah and i wasn't like you know carrying <laughs> extra yeah. 40 pounds or something but even for me who's been active my whole life an athlete and um pretty much on my game it was it was like huge it was a huge experience um and these days i i i'm just low carb you yeah. know i, I kind of i think the, the one thing that was downside about the keto is when you are, your cardio goes because sugar is such an important fuel. And, um, so it's like when you're running or whatever, you're, you're, um, doing whatever your, your cardio goes and your, your lungs like get wheezy. It's, 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 it almost, it, it's, it feels like how it might feel if you had COVID. Um, it's like really, um, interesting, you know, it's just not like, you know, you're not like you, your, your mile split will like go up a minute. Um, but, but like, um, so I, I think carbs are, carbs are obviously good. It's just, we have such a hard time in our daily lives getting the right amount um, sure. that we need. And so, you know, now I get, I think what I actually need. Um, and yeah, I feel all things in moderation, right? Exactly. Except for Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> you can never have enough. Hey, back, back to Bitcoin. I, I'm going to ask you a couple more questions and we'll wrap it up. But um, regarding Bitcoin itself, um, where did like you and your brother differ? Or do y'all share a lot of the same opinions? But is there anything that y'all differ perhaps on projections or outlook or just in general? But in fact, it's that he's a lefty, I'm a righty. So we're mirroring. <laughs> um, so we're different that way. Um, I like to say that foundationally we're identical in terms of our value set kind of like how we look at the world our our position on things like integrity character um completely identical but as you go up the stack more to preferences and whatnot like oh do you like this song or do you like that you know wallpaper color <laughs> um we can differ a lot sure you know um, and so, and I think that's what makes it fun. And that's why we have a good working relationship. We're not always ratifying each other. We actually respectfully, for the most part, disagree 
all the time. I can imagine. Um, and we, we, um, you know, wrestle with ideas and that is really, really cool. Um, so to have someone who you can trust, you know, as much as yourself or more and be completely values aligned and then intellectual sparring partners, um, is a great combination for, you know, uh, going to sports or, you know, um, entrepreneurship and, and whatnot. So, um, we, we differ where it's like fun and good to differ and we don't where it matters that you don't, um, you definitely don't want to be in business with someone who has a different, like value set honesty or <laughs> like, like what's right and wrong. Um, but you, you also, I think you want to surround yourself by people who have great points of view, diverse opinions, experiences. That's what makes culture vibrant and healthy. And that's why New York is so incredible. Um, and a lot of these um, metropolitan areas, which it just brings people together of so many different walks of life. And, um, what comes out of it, like from a, you know, creative, economic, whatever startups, the, the, the creativity that, that happens is just so, so mind blowing. Do you, is, I guess I'm, I'm down South and I guess my question to you would be, you know, you're in New York. It's not been the best year for New York. Um, do you think that we'll see a big resurgence in New York in 2021? So the, the, it's, been, yeah, it's definitely been, it's been a tough, tough year for everyone. Uh, definitely tough for cities with dense populations. Um, I heard that vaccine, I've heard that from a couple of different sources, like that there's very good news on the vaccine fronts. Um, the hard thing is the distribution, but um, I think if all goes well, the vaccine could be heavily distributed to uh, many people in the U.S. by um, late, like early summer, late summer. So I, I do think that, um, look, New York is New York. I think yeah. it'll bounce back. But I, I don't think, um, I think the whole country is going to be, you know, we're going to be a bit on edge until, until probably this time next year. Um and and so, uh, you know, does that mean everything? Everybody's back in in working, you know, in their offices or whatever, and not remote anymore. Um, I don't quite know. You know, I could see the timetable even moving out a little bit more, just because everything has to go off so perfectly in terms of the vaccine distribution on that time frame. So, but in the next few years, I think I think um, let's call it two years from now. Um, maybe less, I think New York, it'll, I think COVID will be a distant memory. That's optimistic. I'd say in general. Yeah. I mean, and, or, and if it's not, it'll be because of poor policy, right? It'll be because the politicians won't let people, uh, take their own risks like adults. Um, they want to babysit people. It'll be because listen, if I in a rest, like it's going to be a tough winter. Like the outdoor dying doesn't work in New York. It's, and now it's, it's going to be cold. <laughs> it's not going to be feasible. Right. Right. And these are businesses that were tough to begin with. Like the margins are razor thin, like hospitality and whatnot. So um, many of them are going, are closing. And if there's not more stimulus and people can't go out and make a living, and their customers aren't free to make adult decisions for themselves based on, you know, what they know about the virus and, and right. their own, you know, personal health and risk appetite. Um, and there's no stimulus. That's yeah, that's not going to be good. So economically, um, yeah. But look, New York's a really resilient city. So look, as long as the politicians don't screw it up, um, we we'll should be okay. I love to hear that. So looking forward to 2021, uh, can you give us anything that you're excited about possibly even with, uh, Gemini or, uh, personally? Um, yeah, so much. Um, I am super excited about 
just kind of more of the same, really. Um, I think that the Bitcoin gold story, look, we're not even at an all-time high in Bitcoin. Right. Um, well, the bull, bull run hasn't even started. So I believe that the the Bitcoin bull run and the wider crypto um, bull run hasn't even started. I think that it's the bottom of the first inning, maybe maybe the top of the second um, in terms of, you know, all of that. Um, Gemini is over 300 and 30 people and growing. We have offices in Oregon, uh, Portland, Portland, Oregon, um, Chicago, New York, London, Singapore. We have a mobile app, both on you know Apple, iOS, Google, Android. Um, we are shipping more new products and features than we ever have. So our velocity is just like continues to accelerate. Um, Lots of cool stuff coming down the pike. We're open up in the U.S., Canada, U.K., Europe, Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea, and many, many other countries. Um, so, you know, couldn't be more bullish on Gemini and what we're building and what we're going to build. I couldn't be more bullish on Bitcoin. The stage couldn't be set better. Um, the, the catalyst for for Bitcoin to thrive right there. Um, it thrives in inflation, it thrives during chaos and uncertainty. And 2020 um, has been, you know, the year of chaos, uncertainty and oncoming inflation. So, um, and remember like, you know, two companies have said, have started taking treasury, like there's gonna be more companies that put their treasury assets in Bitcoin. There's gonna be more legendary institutional investors. One day you're going to see the likes of Bridgewater, large hedge funds taking public positions. Berkshire is going to get in, you know. Yeah, you're going to see you're going to see central banks taking positions in Bitcoin. So like, it hasn't even started. So um, I could go in the weeds on like a lot of stuff, but like I just think thematically I'm excited for, um, you know, grateful for everything that that um, Bitcoin and Gemini's accomplished, but also um super excited that like yeah it's it's like hasn't even started so I'll did you uh did you get an invite to michael saylor's 100k party or are you gonna throw your own party oh um i i talked with michael i'll have to ask him about that i don't think i i don't think he sent the, the invite <laughs> you know but we're, we're uh we we chat often back and forth on text and um and uh i'm a huge fan of obviously what he's doing and doing it in a really um you know public way is putting his money where his mouth is he's very and articulate i think he's been a very huge net positive um and that that makes me super excited to think if if michael saylor can come on board and uh, ramp up that quickly and that clearly communicate imagine how many more people are out there um that can benefit bitcoin in general yeah, he's a brilliant guy and he knows how to speak the language of um, a lot of these, um, a lot of the finance folks. And so when they see a guy who's founded a publicly traded company speaking their language, um, that's super helpful and helping. So yeah, he's been a great, um, he's been a great um, champion for Bitcoin and I've certainly enjoyed um, getting to know him through that. That's awesome. I'll tell you what, I, I've really enjoyed visiting with you today. Um, I've learned a lot about you and I, I think you're really optimistic. I, I hope that you you should make the round on some more of the Bitcoin podcast. I think that uh, the community would love to hear from you more. Yeah, no, thanks. I appreciate the kind words. I've definitely been trying to um, do do more of this and, and obviously a huge fan of, of what you guys do. Um, and so I thought, you know, it'd be great to come on and, and share a little bit more about myself. I'm glad we, we, we it, was, it was a really fun conversation. We, um, I didn't think we would go into keto diets and sugar and, um, I warned yeah. you beforehand. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> true. It's true. Fair. Um, but I love, I love it. Um, I love that we, we did that and kind of like, um, you know, went far and wide. So. Thanks for having me on, Joe, and um, I look forward to doing this again. There will be, what's for sure is there will be many, many more things 
um, very good things to talk about in the future. Awesome. Thank you for your time. I'll let you go now. Thanks, Joe. Okay. Bye now. A quick reminder that all of the content in this episode is for informational and entertainment purposes only. You should not construe the information as legal, tax, investment, financial, or any other advice. Nothing contained in this presentation constitutes a solicitation, recommendation, or offer by BTC Media, the Let's Talk Bitcoin Podcast Network, or any third-party service provider to buy or sell securities or any other financial instruments. Do your own research.